I bet. Okay, well, I've got us at two minutes past the hour, so uh, we are just about to pass the uh, the 100 mark here, and I expect more people will be, be coming on. But uh, first of all, I do appreciate everybody that has showed up here today. This is absolutely uh, a different time we're living in right now. We are in completely uncharted territory. I was thinking the other day, you know, I, the only thing that I had that was even similar that I could remember was 9-11 when, when just the whole world shut down immediately and they brought every airplane out of the sky. Um, but at the same time, I thought, man, that felt totally different because like there was a, I mean, you just thought the world was under attack at that point. And I'm assuming everybody on the phone here today remembers that time. Um, but man, that was a totally different world we lived in at that point. And so this feels very, very different. Um, but I don't know what it's going to feel like when it's still going on in weeks. And, and, and maybe as this thing rolls into a month and people are starting to panic a little bit more, I think people are just sort of unaware right now. But what we wanted to do is take advantage of, you know, the world being shut down a little bit and take a little bit of a different route and do something we've never done before, uh, which is not only are we going to attempt over the next couple of weeks to do training. Yes, free training. But we are also uh, going to do webinars like what we're doing here today where we're going to do virtual tours of evidence rooms. And so today we have, I wanna do some introductions here real quick. Let me start with the guy that is, well, on my screen to my right, I don't know if it's the same order on your end, but uh, Sean Henderson. Sean is the executive director of the Evidence Management Institute. They are a partner agency to tracker products. And Sean, why don't you give the 30 second overview of what you do and how you do it? Well, what we do when we can is we do two day evidence management training classes. Uh, but since we are all confined to quarters, we're going to start uh, doing more online. We also do consulting and we'll go out and kind of assess operations and do what we can to make sure people are sustainable, efficient and effective evidence operations. That's the 15 second version. Excellent. And then directly to Sean's right, at least on my screen, is Krista Morton with the Des Moines Police Department in Des Moines, Iowa. And Krista, we're gonna do a, a, a rather lengthy introduction of yours because I have lots of questions and, and things we're gonna dig into. First of all, I appreciate you being willing to do this. You're the, you're the first run at doing this for us. So uh, again, we are in uncharted territory. And I believe the people certainly that are on the line here today are gonna thoroughly enjoy hearing from you and what you've been doing over a lot of years. So let's just start right there. Uh, Krista, first of all, tell us what, what your title is there. I am the property management manager or supervisor. So, excellent. And and I think what's interesting is you've been doing this for an extremely long amount of time. In fact, I might even throw it out that of all the people that are on the phone here today, you have the most tenure of somebody that has been involved in a property room. How long have you been working for the for the property room at Des Moines? Uh, Twenty five years. So I've been the assistant uh, property manager for most of it, and the manager for two years. So. Are you on some sort of court ordered like penalty or how in the world do you have 27 years working in a property room? I don't know. Just fell upon it. You know, I don't, I didn't even go to school for it, you know, but Hey, my degree helps. So if anybody on here, I am just curious if there's anybody on here that, that is even close to 25 years. So Joe is monitoring the, the questions area right now, or there's a chat window also. But if you've got more than 25 years, uh, identify yourself. It'd be interesting to know if Krista is the most tenured person out there. I think this is going to be hard pressed to find somebody that's got anywhere near 25 years. So Joe, feel free as, as, as we have those rolling in. If you have anybody, just feel free to jump in. I'll let you know. And Joe's not hopping in yet, so I'm going to guess it's pretty quiet out there. All right. Well, let's let's get into a little bit about your evidence room. Well, let's talk a little bit about your background. And I'm just curious. Um, first of all, actually, let me display some statistics. Let's talk about some statistics that are on my screen right now. Um, I hope these are things that you're well aware of, Krista, because these are statistics from your evidence room. Um, since the beginning of time, since you started using a software application and entering evidence, you guys have entered a little over 210,000 uh, 210, pieces of evidence, but you only have 39,941 items checked in. Um, that means you have disposed of a little bit of over 80% of every piece of evidence that has ever come in. 
those are incredible numbers. Um, how much, I'm just curious, on a, in a given month, do you, do you know off the top of your head how much evidence you guys bring in? Um, Number-wise, not right off the top of my head. Um, we're probably right around 35,000, 4,000. Okay. How, how many officers do you guys have? We have around uh, 300, 350. 300. And when it comes to evidence, could you walk me through the process of, of how the evidence gets into the evidence room? So your, your, your folks go out into the streets, they collect evidence. What is the intake process looking like? Um, right, side of, out, right outside of our room, we have lockers. And the officers, they go down to the report writing room, enter it into the system, and then they drop it in those lockers. And then it's there for me when I get in. So all of your officers, all 300 of them are logging into the software and entering their own evidence. Do they also tag all the evidence? They put the label on it, yes, uh-huh. Okay, how does that, I'm just curious, has it always been that way? I mean, if you go back to before you had an electronic system, did, did you, you guys, you guys did lots of handwritten paperwork, right? I mean, I know most people do handwritten paperwork, but go ahead. Yeah, they, the officers always did the, all the property when we had the property sheets. They would write it all down, log it, and then just staple it to the items and then throw it in our locker. And then we would baggage them all together and put them on a shelf. So I'm curious, when you went to an electronic system, so and, and this was only a couple of years ago, you actually got to the point of your officers using an electronic system to enter all their evidence. Just explain to us really quickly, what was that like? Was it was it commotion? Did people, did people accept it? Just give me an overview as to, as to what the temperature was of the Des Moines PD when you explain to people, we're going to go from handwritten paper to you're going to log into a system and you're even going to print a barcode label out. Well, you have your mixed groups. You know, you have the old school that hates anything new, and then you have the new people that are used to computers, and they understood it and did it hook, line, and sinker. So, you know, still to this day, we've been doing it for how long now? About five years almost. We still have people that sit there and complain and say they hate it and they want to go back to paper. So, <laughs> you can't make everybody happy. <laughs> So you say so you even have your own complainers there. I mean, th those people exist anywhere. Yes, yep. But, but no, today, most people, like it. they really like it over in our narcotics unit. They love it over there between the old way they used to do everything. So it's really streamlined on narcotics moving dope or our identification section moving property down. So it's really helped streamline that. I'm just curious, do you have any idea, and I know I'm putting you on the spot for something you may not have specifics on, so just try to guess. If you had to guess the amount of time that it used to take to manually do all the hit, let's, let's pretend you had a case with 10 items in it. So go think back to the days where you're handwriting all of this out. How long did that take to handwrite all of that out versus what they're doing today? Do you even have an assessment of what that might look like? No, the only thing I can say is that, um, it's helped go to the detectives to get rid of the items. That's been the biggest favor. Even though we were pretty good about doing disposing of items, this has made it a lot easier and uh, faster for us to get rid of. That's really the only the difference. Because um, we didn't really write out the property sheets. The officer still did that. Yeah. We entered it and we had QTEL before. And that was supposed to be for the officers to enter. And they still never entered it. So we would have to enter that. That would take maybe you know, 15, 20 minutes to enter that stuff when we entered it. We didn't do it, as you know, we didn't do it correctly. We batched it together. We didn't enter each in individual item. So now every individual item is being entered into trackers. So right. we're you know more of what we have now than what we did before. I guess a really important question I did not ask earlier is how many people work in the, the evidence room at Des Moines? There, well, in my office, because we do impounded vehicles, uh, we have four full-time and one part-time. Okay. And so people, there's basically two and a half of us doing property. 
So I want everybody to remember those numbers. Two and a half right there is a significant number. When we start getting into some more specifics about intake and disposition, um, you know, th this is a pretty sizable operation that you're running there, and you're running it essentially for the property side, two and a half people. So, so keep that in mind. We'll, we'll dig a little bit more into that as, as we get going along. Um, so one other thing about your intake process, all of your officers come back to a central area to enter it. They don't do it from their squad car. Or, or anywhere else, they all do it from one specific area. Correct, correct, yeah. Does that, cre how many, how, that, does that create any sort of a pile up? Do you ever get a situation where you've got X number of people in the room and, and there's just not enough, like somebody's coming back later? No, the only time I have issues, like with licensings and stuff like that, the only time I have issues is when I go in and I give reminders about doing their task for disposition. And then that's when I get a log of everybody going in trying to do their tasks. But Excellent. when for them, you know, there's never a backlog or anything like that. Okay. And that is a little bit, you know, and I will say, you, if you if you talk to everybody that was on the phone here today, you'd get a little bit of a difference from everybody. Some people, their officers are entering it from the vehicles and, you know, some they all process it from one central area. And, and I do understand the processing it from one central area. It allows them to package and do everything together. What What is your overall, I mean, when when you go to the lockers on a daily basis, so you come in every morning, you know there's X amount of evidence sitting in there. And I'm guessing, you know, in, in a given day, you have anywhere between 50 and 100 items that, that are coming in based on what I'm seeing for your, your overall monthly statistics. At this point in life, is that a pretty seamless process? Do you get a lot of problems in that or, or does it just work smoothly at this point? No, I mean, it's smooth, but there's always issues. I mean, yep. you get people that don't put proper um, items on property very often, so then they don't do it right. Um, so they need to make sure, like for our currency, a lot of times back in the day, they would keep it all together. And so now I'm like, no, you guys split it. It needs to be its own item because we have a way of recording how much money we have in our vault. We keep all our money. We don't make it into a check or anything. So trying to get them to change and count the money and make it a separate item, that's a simple thing, but it's an ongoing process. They never remember. So. Excellent. I was thinking of my next, my next question in there. Um, Man, I lost track of my, I looked over to my screen on the right there and I was looking to, to come up with something. I lost my, my total train of thought there. Um, oh, I know the question I was going to ask. So when you have problems with evidence and everybody eventually is going to, what does your rejection process look like? I mean, do you, how do you go about telling them there's a problem, they need to come fix it? Usually send an email out to them saying, hey, you made a mistake, come fix it. Uh, go down to the watch office, get the sergeant, lieutenant, tell them, will you send them up so they can fix it? Um, it uh, kind of depends on the day and what's going on and how busy. Because they might be on days off, so then they're going to have to come in and do it when they get in. So it's they're pretty good about doing it. And sometimes, I know I shouldn't, but sometimes it's like they're on four days off. I'm just going to fix it. I'll split it out, do it for them, and let them know. And I send them an email, hey, make sure you do it this way. So... Now, will you do that with even, say, guns, drugs, and money? No. Money money I have. I split out money. But when it comes to, we do our drugs differently um, because we, the narcotics unit, they will hold on to their drugs. And then I, I gave a picture of a door. One of the doors that I sent a picture of you with is our drug room. And we cannot get into that room unless somebody from narcotics comes. That door, right? Yep, that middle door that door. That's our drug door. And nobody can get in it by themselves. Somebody from my office and somebody from narcotics office, we both have to go in that room at the same time. And so mm -hmm. then they'll schedule dope moves and we, um, narcotics has their own office. And so then when they get ready to move it, they'll put it in a spe special folder, narcotics to be transferred. So then when we check it in, then we can check to make sure we scanned everything in and put it in their location inside that room. So it's a good checks and balances. So they don't drop the drugs off to us and we take care of it. It's always a two team effort when we move mm. dope. Let me let me bring Sean into that discussion. Sean, I'm I mean, I've 
I've seen a lot of property rooms. I can't, that may be the first time I, which am not speaking as an authority, have seen, you know, checks and balances like that. But is, is that a, what are your, what are your thoughts? I mean, I'm sure you think that's a good thing, but what, what do you teach on that? Is that like something you would teach on how to do that? Well, I think that's one of the fun things about, can you hear me? Is my mic up? I, I hear you. Yes. I think that's one of the fun things about doing something like this is seeing how other people do it. That's not anything that I've ever heard of in terms of like full-time mm. storage. I would ask, I mean, do, do they store their narcotics in that room until they go to trial or until they're disposed of? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And what do you do with just general patrol officer dope that they pick up on the streets on a patrol case? So we have a, a special locker that's uh, under lock and key, and they'll drop it in that locker, and they have a designated person in the narcotics office, and they will come over and grab it. They're the only ones that have the key, and take the dope out and record it, log it, and then she's responsible for taking it to the state lab, court, or anything like that. So your narcotics unit has, I mean, they handle pretty much all the narcotics evidence for the entire department? Correct. Correct. Okay. And how long have y'all been doing that? Forever. Forever. Okay. I just, I was just kind of curious because I've not, that's not something that I've heard of commonly. I mean, I love the idea of having extra eyes and hands uh, securely on, on narcotic storage, especially if it's, if, if the security is heightened, it, it, it absolutely makes sense. But I was just curious how y'all got there. So if that's just historically the way it's always, yeah. always been done. Yeah, we've always had the two key system and nobody, no two people can be in that room. Not, I can't just be in it by myself and somebody for narcotics. We both have to be there. If somebody has to leave, we shut the door and we leave. I would imagine because you're a part of a, of a larger department, that makes that a little more feasible. But, man, I'll tell you what, having a two-person rule on something like that, that man, that that feels like that's got some validity to it right there. Because my, my guess is that's going to cut down on the potential for at least a problem related to drugs anyways. That's awesome. Joe, you yeah. got anything coming across uh, question-wise that anybody's got? Just while we're waiting on Let me unmute for a second. On Joe, I mean, we teach in our training classes and pretty much every evidence management training class is going to teach something similar is that you have heightened security on drug storage areas. But what you've done at Des Moines is unique in the sense that, I mean, there are a lot of agencies that will have two person drug vault entry rules or entry requirements, but you've got entry requirements that go outside of the evidence management unit and involve the narcotics unit. So, you know, that's even though it's something I've never heard of, it sounds like a great idea. And if it works for you, that's, a, that's awesome. Cause it certainly um, achieves that higher level of security. We incorporated that for our vault too, but it's two people. It's two people in our office or if nobody in our office isn't available, the record sergeants, they have um, that also access are the two keys. So we'll have to grab them and they'll have to fob us in with somebody in our office. So there's a two key entry. So just one person can't go in there by themselves. Now is that physical keys or access card keys? It's fobs. We have key fobs now. Okay. Excellent. Just I got a, got a question from the audience here. One of them is who are your agencies responsible for your narcotics disposals? I'm can you repeat? I didn't understand. Yeah, he, uh, he asked who who in your agency is responsible for the actual narcotic disposal. Well, that's another process. Um, what happens is when we got tracker, it kind of shifted over to me before narcotics kind of got the items ready or what we were going to dispose. So we generate a list. Then I give it back to the narcotics officers because uh, narcotics officers are the ones that are telling me what can be destroyed. So once I create that list of everything they told me I can destroy, I print it out, I give it back to them so they can double check it. Yes, everything is still okay to destroy. Once I have that list, then that list will go to our county attorney's office and then they will sign off on it. Yes, everything on this list we can destroy. So then when we set our destroy date, we have somebody from our office, usually me or Nick, 
Then we have um, somebody from our Office of Professional Standards in the room. We have a sergeant from narcotics, and then we have another officer from narcotics in the drug room when we do our disposal. We do it twice a year, and then we take it to a place and burn. And when they take it to a place to burn, that is the, somebody from our Office of Professional Standards, the sergeant from narcotics, and then the other officer in narcotics. And then they'll go burn it. And I'll go back to my screen, so just to elaborate on that a little bit, that's why you can tell if you look at this graph in the software where, you know, for many of you that are our clients, you're, you're familiar with this graph where it shows the amount of evidence coming in every month and how much is going out. That's why in the case of Des Moines, when I show this off, I'm always saying these big bumps. And so, like, I can tell in July of 2019, that's when they did a large burn. In fact, that you can tell in February and March of this year is where they ramp up. These are the twice a year jumps that they typically see because that's how they go about doing their dispositions. Now, I think what's amazing, Kristen, I, I don't want to get knee deep in disposition right now because we'll talk about that a little bit later on, but but you are one of those agencies that, that can say at the end of every year, when we look back and make an assessment of what we've done over the year, we've gotten rid of as much evidence as what we've brought in. Is that something that that you actively attempt to pursue, or do you think it just happens that way? Um, back in the day when we had the old system, it was something we had to actively do. Um, Tracker has helped streamline that, and it makes it easier to stay on top of it now. Um, if we didn't have Tracker, I don't think it would be as well as it is now, just because we've been so much busier. But back in the day, it was something we actively did to try to get detectives to give us destroy subs. Did you always, I'm curious, if, if you think back to even 10 years ago, did you still have two and a half people working in evidence or did you ever have more? Um, no, maybe we have had one more person, but it's, we had a cadet that used to work full time and we lost that cadet. So we had just one more body. Yeah. And I'm curious, if you go back 10 years, and since you've been there for 10 years, if you look at what your daily process, and again, I'm, I'm think back to 10 years ago, what did your general day look like versus what it looks like right now? I'm just curious, is there a big difference in what your normal day has looked like from 10 years ago to now? Um, no, I wouldn't say, no, it's pretty the same, kind of stayed the same, just Streamlining, like moving uh, narcotics when they want to move their dope over to the permanent location, or IDENT, because IDENT will go out and take things from the street, and then they'll transfer it over to our office. So just things like that has made that process go quicker than what it used to, because before it would be a longer process, you'd have to prepare for it. Now they can just call and say, hey, I want to move dope, since now we just got to check it in instead of pulling the papers, changing the system, it just, yeah. we can do it in five, 10 minutes and they're done. They're on their way and we're on ours. So trackers just made things go quicker for us. So then maybe a better question to ask is how many officers did you have 10 years ago? Would you even have a guess as to what that looked like? We're probably about the same, probably less yeah. now. I didn't know. I guess what I was trying to hit at was, has your intake, you know, gone up dramatically? Um, you know, I, I did. I'm looking for some of the differences over the last 10 years and and what you've experienced. So, well, we we can get in. Is there anything more with with your intake? I mean, certainly the drug thing you just described was a very unusual process. Is there anything else about your intake that you would say, oh, this is a little bit of a different way than we do it than anybody else? Um. No, I mean, the only thing is the money thing, and then I try, I count all the money just so I, um, since we don't, I think a lot of agencies deposit the money and cut mm -hmm. a check, and we keep our cash. Yeah. And so, we ha that's why we have the double entry, and then I can keep a running total of how much cash is in there to make sure they're doing the forfeiture processes and things like that, so we can get the money to us if it's ours. So I got a couple of questions I'm seeing on here that are that are coming from people. And the question that has come up from uh, Deborah, she says, are you required to get a court order uh, or a sign off from a judge? For a drug store, yes. Is that is that the only thing you have to go to a judge for is, is, a, is a is a drug destroy? Correct. Correct. Okay. Yes. 
And so, and, and, and to elaborate on that a little bit more, I mean, I believe you're sending them a list. How, how, how big are these lists that you generally send to them with items you're wanting to destroy? Because they're really large lists, right? Right. Um, last drug destroy, we had 4,000 items. Um, not all of them were drugs. Probably maybe 2,500 were drug items. So we'll send just the drug items for them to log, to double check to make sure nothing has changed with the case. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Another question I've got: What what are your normal? Oh yeah, this is a good one. What are your normal hours of operation? Days only? Evenings? How how often do you guys operate? Good question, Stacy. Um, our office is uh, seven thirty to four, and I work six to two. Okay. So you're not twenty four seven. No. No. Um, I come in at 6 to, so I can help any first watch officers if they need anything, the early morning people, morning. Okay. Um, and then I usually, with Tracker, I can get on and help that way because it's uh, web-based, so I can help from home. And if they, if they email, I can answer questions. Mm -hmm. So I do a lot from home and on weekends where I can help better than what we did before. Okay. Stacy, who just asked that question a moment ago, she works with the Omaha Police Department. So in a few weeks, we're actually, Stacy will be on camera and we're going to do the same thing with her. Uh, she just happens to be part of a significantly larger department uh, in, in the Omaha Police Department. So I, I'm guessing they run even larger hours than 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 your daylight hours. So but we'll let her, her get into that. Somebody else do on there, don't you need a court order to dispose of items seized in a search warrant? Um, that would be from narcotics, yeah. Um, then detectives will do really do um, the non-drug items, and they check with the judicial dialogue, and they just give us authorization, and okay. when they say it's okay, we destroy it. Right. And here's always a good one. How long does it take for your judges to get back to you on these destruction orders? Uh, usually right away. Usually when we get the list and when we're done, usually a day or two and they sign off on it. I'm going to go ahead and speak for everybody out there that that is not a normal response right there. I think you just got the, <laughs> I, I don't think there's going to be a lot of people that are going to be used to uh, the courts or attorneys responding in, in that amount of time. So is that because, I, I mean, how in the world do you think that happens that way? Because there's no way people are going to by and large agree that that's their experience. Um, I don't know, maybe just because that's been our working relationship for several years. They just, they have a one person they contact and he's pretty good about doing it. So okay, it's not all the time. It's twice a year. So they know it's coming. Hmm. Been fortunate, I guess. And you know what, listen, that's an important thing to point out there. When I point out the disposition statistics that, that they experience and, and when, and I tell this to people all the time. Um, Des Moines, Iowa is running an 80% disposition rate. That is that is what I would quantify as, as exceptional. But the problem is, is, you know, a lot of people are in a position where they aren't getting a day or two response. They may not be getting a response at all. And so, you know, disposition does take into a lot of different variables. Some things you cannot control quite as easily. Um, and I was going to say, I don't know what, what questions people have out there. Uh, yeah, I'm like in somebody saying in West Virginia, it's three to five months. Uh, you know, they're, they're waiting three to five months to get responses on these things. And so uh, another quick question I got, do you, uh, I do you find the detectives more. are, I'm sorry, go ahead. I just want to ask one quick kind of disposition question. I know that for drugs, we, we know your process there, but I think it might be interesting for people deep on every piece of evidence that you dispose of do you obtain an officer or a, a sworn investigators uh authorization to dispose of that yeah uh yes all the cases we get is assigned to any case all of them get assigned to a detective and we don't do anything unless they sign off saying okay to destroy okay. we don't we don't destroy anything we don't release anything it all has to come through a detective gives us and, too much control. And absolutely, that's the way it should be. And I think that a lot of people might hear that 80% and think, well, surely they're yeah. just authorizing this stuff on their own. I guess what I wanted to clarify is that for every piece of evidence that goes out of the Des Moines Police Department, yeah. it's, it's done the right way. 
I mean, you obtain authorization from someone outside the unit. Some things you go above and beyond and get court orders for, for destructions or, or authorization from the DA. The, the important thing is you're not just disposing of stuff arbitrarily. It's all with appropriate authorization and documentation. And I think that's important for people to hear. Yeah. I have a question in regard to that, and I want to let everybody know that's listening online that the questions are rolling in now. It is going to be impossible for me to get to every question. I need to let Joe do a little bit more here where he's weeding through them and 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 jumping in with those things. But I do appreciate the questions. We just we can't possibly cover all of them because I think we've already had 75 questions here and we're just getting the ball rolling. So one thing I do want to throw out, Krista. You went from, so your detectives are involved in the disposition process. How do you go about notifying detectives that a case or items are up for review in a disposition? How do you specifically go about doing that? Um, lots through Tracker. Uh, when the auto disposition rolled out, I went to all the Gold Braid lieutenants in the area and say, how long do you want to, when do you want to get a notice for a theft case? So they picked the six months, a year, uh, found property 90 days, so they'll get a notice to review it after that period of time. And the detectives also are responsible for notifying the people to come pick it up if they're going to release it. They send out the letters, be it certified, any kind of notification, they do all of that also. We don't do any notification. Was that always that? I mean, your, your detectives have been involved in this process. Is that as long as you can remember that they've been doing the disposition? Correct, yes. So I'm curious, how do they like the automated system where they get an email saying a case is up for you? How do they like that in comparison to getting the paperwork that they used to get? Well, like anything else, at first they didn't like it, but now they like it. That's like a lot better. They don't like it just because it's easier to stay on them if they don't do them. Because I have a system, <laughs> so they have 30 days. If they don't respond in 30 days, we go in and we do a second notice where we include the sergeant. If they still don't do it after 30 days, then we include the lieutenant. If it gets to the fourth notice, it goes to the captain. And usually when the captain gets it, he's, you have to have the help of yeah. the gold break to enforce it. And I'm lucky that they get on them and saying, hey, it should not even be coming to me. Your people need to get these done. So that is tremendous. You know, sometimes you can't get anything done unless you have the backing. And I have the backing, so. That's something, Sean, I know, you know, that's one of the gears we have in our, in our sort of our larger, these are things you need in order to pull off doing evidence and doing it well. And that is getting back up from the, the people at the top. And I mean, that's, Krista, that's fantastic you get that because I'm assuming there's people on here that don't get a lot of support. Um, Sean, how, if, if you would speak for just a moment, how would somebody that maybe is not getting the kind of support that Krista is getting, how would they go about getting an agency to back up something like that? Well, that's the million dollar question for most uh, property rooms that don't have you know, adequate support for management. I mean, there are a few things that you can do in the short term, but you really have to start kind of quantifying the problem and start learning how to speak the language of management or, or police chiefs or sheriffs. Uh, they speak a language related to liability and, and I guess, quantifiable problems. If you tell them that things are terrible, well, terrible doesn't mean anything to a police chief. But if you can show them and document quantifiably, look, I have this much evidence coming in. I only get rid of this much evidence. I mean, if my ratio is extremely low, you can demonstrate mathematically, well, our, our, we're going to fill up within three to four years if we don't do something. Or if you bring them a process that exposes the agency to liability, most of the time police executives respond to that. Uh, that's usually one of the first steps is just learning how to speak the language that they speak. And Krista, it sounds like Krista was in a unique position where the detectives were always involved in this process. So this was just simply moving from something that was paper-based to something that was electronic. And so she wasn't fighting the battle of just getting detectives to authorize disposition stuff. So, well, Joe has some questions, Krista. Uh, Joe, let me give you the floor. Why don't you throw some questions out for Krista? Awesome. We're going to do shotgun style. You'll know, like this. I'll throw them out to you. You answer them. Okay. As, quick, as quickly as possible. What, you know, one, one thing that we do have coming up is one of our webinar topics is on that leadership without authority. 
um, that exact concept we're talking about of how do you motivate people without having authority. So um, one of the questions is, do you find that detectives are hesitant to release items um, just in case it becomes pertinent later? Uh, some yes, some no. Some are very cautious about what they release and destroy, and some are not. Um, probably time on floor plays a big part on that. Some people have gotten burned by getting rid of something and destroy something too soon. So some yes, some no. Okay, fair enough. Do you have a set day to return uh, safekeeping items? Um, how many days? That's uh, for return as far as to the owner or destroy? Do you only return them on, let's say, Tuesdays or Wednesdays, like one particular oh, day? No, no, we're open for business 7.30 to 4. They can come anytime. No set hours, just by our business hours. Mm, all right. Um, let's see here. Do you um, assign <clears throat> even the items that are um, citations, do those get assigned to detectives for disposal? Yes, every single piece of property has to go through somebody outside our office to authorize this disposition. All right. So if it's a, something with traffic, it'll go to a traffic officer. And let's see here. Uh, I think that's just about it. Yeah. So these are all kind of a, a repeat. Last one, drug paraphernalia. How do you get rid of that? Same process? Uh, Drug, a lot of our drug paraphernalia, drug paraphernalia goes along with the drug destroy, and so they don't want a court order. The court orders are only for the drugs, and so if they say okay for the drugs, the detective is saying okay for the paraphernalia, so we just go ahead and destroy it. You can't uh, give it back, and when we destroy it, like physically destroy it, we take it to our dump, and we watch them run over it. They have those big bulldozers, and we watch them roll over it, and then we leave. Let me let me delve into another area. Uh, people working for you in the evidence room. Um, so think about you know the the folks that uh, like I'm thinking of Nick because I because I know Nick and have talked to him a lot. Um, the people that you work with. I mean, I'm trying to think of the good question. How do you find good people? How did you find maybe Nick? How do you know that you have a good person to bring in and work in the evidence room with you? Um, that's a, good that's question. a tough question, by the way. Yes. Um, cause my main focus was is because dealing with tracker and us being the administrator's tracker, I wanted somebody that was confident with the computer and not afraid to figure out what was going on if there was issues. So I focused on finding somebody that was knew the computer system. The other stuff can be trained. Um, sometimes computer stuff cannot be trained. So I was looking for somebody that was confident and was not afraid of the computer. And that was the big thing for me. And he's confident and he's not afraid to get go in and see what he can figure out on his own. Because some things you just got to figure out on your own. So let's drive that for a minute then. What what is maybe what has he pushed you to do that you weren't comfortable doing on your own once you did have him all of a sudden having somebody that was confident with computer systems? Wh where did he push you or make you guys better that you might not have done on your own? Um, nothing. We've changed a few things, but nothing drastic where he's made any huge changes, okay. I can say. Not yet, I, anyway. I, I would, even, again, when I look at your process, I mean, just the things you described, I, if Sean were to come in and do an audit, he might have a hard time finding things you would would change significantly because the results you're getting are very good. And so, but I'm sure if we interviewed everybody that's on the phone here today, we might see some large things that could be changed. So I wasn't suggesting that something needed to be changed. I just didn't know if having somebody that was was more confident in a computer system but I also say the same thing. I've seen you do some things that like a lot of our clients don't do, like with tagging and your disposition. Why don't you walk us through the process really quickly? How do you go about documenting things that can be disposed of in the software? So like maybe somebody's told you to get rid of it, but you don't just run to the evidence room and grab it and dispose of it. How do you go through the process of it's been authorized, now we're prepping it for this final disposition? Um, can... Okay, so this is my dashboard here that you got. Can they see that? 
Yeah, uh, everybody can see my dashboard right now. So if you tell me to go somewhere, I'll, I'll go to it. Um, where's the one where it has um, uh, temp lockers? Is that the, do you have that on there? I don't know. You know what? So do me a favor, because that is a really good one to show off. I know that's on your screen. If, if you'll hop into your, are you logged into the software or can you log in really quickly? Yeah, I can. So while you're, so, logging, while you're logging in, let me tell people, this is what's so awesome about Krista is she is not scared to dig into the software and, and look at some of these dashboard things she has made. I mean, this is this is what I would describe as unusual from when I look at our clients. I mean, building these things out to have all these narcotic things broken down by users in here. And so in part, why Krista has the success, success that she does getting rid of stuff is she has a keen awareness of what she's got in the room right now. So Krista, do, are you logged in now? Yes, I am. So do me a favor, give me the ID number at the top of that widget and I'll drop it on my screen here. 460-0. Perfect. All right, so now here is, uh, which is that it right there? It's this one right there, right? Oh, mm -hmm. Okay, so go ahead and explain that. There's a lot to explain. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but maybe give them a 50,000 foot overview of what you do with this specific window right here. I mean, I know there's a lot of stuff on here, but but what do you generally use this for? This is to kind of keep track of, like, we don't go and, like what you said, if we get a G-Story, we don't go pull it and put it somewhere. What we do is uh, on the tag system, we put destroy approved. And if you can see items okay to be destroyed, there's only seven now. So I already generated a new list, which is items to pull for 299. So we have 299 items ready to be pulled for destroy. So what we will do is we'll pull all those items. Go ahead, do you have a question? Or no, I mean, this is this is unbelievably fantastic. And in just one minute, I'll show everybody how she does the tagging, because what you're telling me here is this is a large list of things that are ready to go. Is everything or all of these rows related to stuff ready to go out the door? Um, yeah, so like with DCI, we have those approved um, our bikes, how many bikes we have for sale. And then what we do is we have our list to pull, and then once we get ready, we put it in a holding place. So that's why we have two lists. And then here we're already getting into next year drug destroy, September drug destroy. We already have that many items for drug destroy. Yeah. So when I start generating the list, and then we go down to, down at the bottom is our forfeited money. That's where I say I start keeping track of our forfeited money and what we get to deposit. So. Hey Joe, I'm just curious if Krista's had any job offers come in yet on the uh, on the uh, question window here. <laughs> How many temporary lockers do you have? Is that one of the questions? Yeah, this is a good question. I was trying to find, figure it out from the uh, widget. Oh, we don't even go by. They don't. They just pick temp lockers because our number system don't work. I think we have like uh, maybe 30, 40. Okay, fair enough. But do you have, I'm, I'm curious, I think you threw that out a minute ago. Do you have a widget for your desktop that shows you what items are in the temporary lockers? Yeah, it's the very first one, items in temp locker. Oh, is it? Oh, it's right here. Okay, I'm sorry. So right here, it's the very first row. You, you've got six items in the temporary locker right now. Yeah. Okay. And, and just and let me, one of, go ahead. Go ahead. Nope, you got well, it. I was going to say, one of the issues we had was the drug lockers we weren't being able to keep track of what officers were dropping in the drug lockers. Mm -hmm. So when the officers get drugs, they put their location as drug temp locker. And yeah. so the officer from narcotics, they have to come see us and we have to scan each and every item and then we check it out to the narc officer. And then we come back and every single time that should be zero to make sure she's taking all the drugs and all the drugs are accounted for. Mm -hmm. So just for everybody's benefit real quick, just so you see the way Krista is doing this. So I'm gonna take this bikes approved for destroy and I'm gonna click on that number right there. And so it's gonna take me into the searching mechanism that she's built out and it's gonna show these two bikes right here. But the way she is doing all of this is through tags over here. 
So if you're not familiar with using tags in our software, or if you've looked at them and said, I don't need to use those, this is exactly how she's going about doing it. She will take an individual piece of evidence, she will edit it, and either put a new tag on it or an existing tag. So every one of her searches, as a matter of fact, if I go back up to the search parameters of this one specific search, it is based on all items that are checked in that are in that storage location, but it also has this tag applied to it down here at the bottom. So as so, she's not moving items per se around the evidence room. Literally, they're just going in and either re-tagging them or applying a tag. And that simple action of applying the tags will make these, these elements on her screen light up and the numbers change. So I'm guessing every day, Krista, I don't know how often you go in and refresh this every day, but I'm guessing you spend a lot of time looking at these numbers that are on the screen right here. Yeah, because mm -hmm. we go by that determining we create a list to pull when we have about 300 items. So when we have about 300 items, then we generate a list to go pull for destroy. Okay, so let me refresh. So go back. So you're telling me when you get up to roughly 300 items in an area, you'll or whatever the the parameter is, then you'll go grab them and do that destroy. Correct. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then when we log it off, since I put that in the tag area, I put destroy approved. So when we yeah. scan them to log them all off, we go over there and double check that they all say destroy approved. Just in case something accidentally might get pulled, it you know, we catch it. Because we scan every single item to, to log off as being destroyed. Yeah. So I'm curious, let me throw another question out to you. You've, you've told me you have two and a half people. Let's assume that's around 100 hours a week. Do you have any idea if you add managing tasks, which are a disposition process, and managing all these tags to do disposition and doing disposition, how much of those 100 hours in a given week would you say are, are, are specifically geared toward the disposition process? Is something involved with actually getting rid of evidence? Ooh, it can vary. I, I end up doing a lot of that myself. So sometimes it's a lot. And when I have to get on people to do the task, um, not even begin maybe right. 10 hours maybe a couple hours a day so do you th you think in a given week you're spending 20 hours a week doing some element of disposition that or less yeah i okay. mean it's an everyday thing it's an everyday going in and looking seeing um people do a task to destroy something so doing it i because of all what's going on with the coronavirus I haven't been able to go to the back end of the task and send out reminders saying, hey, it's been 30 days. This is your second, third notice. I haven't been able to do that. Yeah. So now that's backlog. So that will probably take me a good hour, hour and a half to get caught up on that. Yeah. And it's funny because you're speaking the, in these things in terms of like, it's, you know, you're th like people are out here. Like I would, I would give my right arm to be able to speak like you're speaking and you almost speak no nonchalantly about it because it's just been that way for so long. You're like, well, it may, I mean, no kidding. I'm telling you what people are thinking. I spend uh, maybe an hour and a half to get caught up on disposition. And there are people like, I'm going to spend a thousand hours and still not get caught up on it. And you're sitting here like, oh, it's an hour and a half. We'll get caught up. <laughs> so yeah, kudos to you on that. Uh, Joe, I, I, we've got less than 10 minutes left and, and I got, you know, I, listen, I, there is no joke. We could sit here and talk for hours with Krista and, and I want to be respectful of her time, but we're going to be doing more of these things. And what I'm going to try to do is when we get into talking to Omaha or Bowling Green, Kentucky, we'll ask them different questions and we'll get into different things to where, you know, maybe we get a larger perspective by bringing a lot of people into the discussion as to what's going on. And I'm telling you, there may be days we'll just get on here and we'll have a free for all where people can ask questions and we'll have a panel. So it'll it, we, we could have three or four people on here responding to different questions that are going on. And how do you go about doing what you're doing? Because I believe this right here is unbelievably valuable for the greater you know audience of evidence administrators that are out there. So I want to thank you, Krista, for, for doing this. Um, but if you have any last minute questions, if there's something you really want to know from Krista, we're running out of time. So make sure to get those in. 
I'm going to jump into an area that, that of something you guys do that you are unbelievably good at, and that is doing inventories, going through the process of, of verifying the stuff that is in all the lockers. Now, Krista, how, how often do, are you guys doing inventories of storage locations? Um, we have like three specific areas besides our drug room. Um, I sent pictures of those. Um, so we'll do, so starting here in April, we're going to do our basement area. Um, like the guns, that's our basement area. Yep. That is our new addition area. That's our biggest area. Um, we did that a year ago. Um, okay. So we try doing a floor a year. That's our goal. Uh, okay. Narcotics, drug room. The drug room we do every six months. Every time we have a drug destroy, we do an inventory. Why is the floor that color? That, you remember Sharon, right? You'll have to ask Sharon. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute, hold on. I'm thinking like you took over a kid's area. Are you telling me at some point in time that that floor actually meant something to property and evidence? She wanted, she had that floor in our basement storage and we had extra, so they just put it in there. Okay. All right. That's her. <laughs> we, let, let me back up. I think I missed some. So you, you guys also have the high density shelving. How long have you had that? Um, Wow, okay. We've had the base, we have some in the basement. We So we've had those a good 10, 15 years. Those are our supplies for the officers. Yeah. That, um, that area we've had maybe six, seven years. We've had it for a while. Okay. And then our main area, or the bigger area in the back, we could not have them there just because they couldn't, the weight of the moving shelves. So we yeah. just have the stationary shelves in our bigger area. Okay. So, so let's go back to those inventories for just a minute. I want to point out, and, and I don't even know the, the span of time on this, but they've done 1,203 inventories in the last couple of years. Um, so what they will routine, routinely do, and so I guess you, uh, and so I've never met John, I guess John's somebody that works in, or John's in your narcotics area, I'm guessing. Yep. And so, yes. so what I can say, and I'm curious, you know, as you guys are going through and doing these inventories and, and you guys, look, I mean, look at this list. This is all from March 5th. So on March 5th, you can tell they had a big push where they were doing a lot of inventories. What what are your I mean, how does that normally go for you? Are things coming back and they're as you expect? Are, are you finding problems? I, I mean, as much as you want to elaborate on that. Yeah, there's always little issues. Um, something gets missed. Um that's supposed to have been logged off or in the wrong shelf. Yeah, it's always a positive when you get no errors, so you're happy. Yeah. But it doesn't happen very often. There is always something, yeah. unfortunately. Nature of the beast when you have thousands of items. Yep. And you know what I generally see for most people out there because they are so busy with intake and I guarantee you there are people listening that are that are just overwhelmed with the intake process, much less actually spending 20% of your time every week doing dispositions and adding inventories on top of that. So I, I'm telling you, when you go back to this, yes, it is great when you have an attorney or a court that will work with you. And it's certainly great when you have leadership doing these things. But when you look at how Chris is operating here, she is clearly using the software to tell her things she needs to know about her evidence. She's doing the proper inventories. And so, I mean, all of this stuff leads back to where, um, you know, if Sean went in and did an inventory, by the way, I just noticed it got really dark here, and I look like I'm about to blow up. Does it, do you notice that? <laughs> I look like really red. Whew. Um, I still look pale, though, so it, it balances out. Must be all the talking <laughs> I'm doing. But but Krista, if in one of these days we're gonna will if with with your blessing we're gonna send Sean up to do an audit, and I, it would be interesting to have that. Have you done, have you gone through an audit? I'm curious. Have you been through an audit? Yes, we have. Yep, we've been through an audit. Okay, how long how long ago was that? And 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 was, was that like a state audit or or who who did the audit? Um, it's actually probably been about 17, 18 years ago. Um, oh. and it was through a, and it was a CPA firm that did it, came and did it. Okay, so it's been a while let me, ago. Let me ask mm -hmm. this. I have a question that's kind of based on that. Have you guys done a business process analysis? 
for your evidence no. section? No. no, we have not. Okay. There we go. So again, I, I guess the, the, what I was driving at is I believe, like from from everything I can tell, you guys are a very well run organization. Um, I would expect that if Sean came up and did an audit, his audit would would conclude the same. And I'm sure, like anybody, he would have recommendations and things that that he would improve on. Um, but generally, when I see somebody talking about how they have two locks on the narcotics door, and you know nobody can go in, you know you got to have two people and you're doing inventories and you're doing dispositions and things are running smoothly. Um, usually these are not things we see in a poorly run organization. You know, the, these are, these are things that are exemplary with what you're doing. So, all right, guys, we're down to the last couple of minutes. Is there any last things you want to throw out, Joe? Yes. I had a good question from Dana Kelly. Do you guys utilize um, a drug drop box? Like, yes, there's a for patrol officers. They will drop their drugs in. Um, it's a small safe with a slit in the mo in the uh, opening on the top, like a cash. Then you spin the knob and it goes to the bottom. That's where they drop their drugs. All right. Um, what about like a public drug drop off for prescription drugs and things like that? We have an old mailbox out in our lobby where they drop those off. And narcotics unit is responsible for grabbing those too. And then we'll take it and put it in our drug room. So those are, okay, so those are tracked separately then from your CDS? We, they just drop them and they just put them in a bag. And when it comes to destroy, we just take them with destroy. We don't track them whatsoever. Awesome. Next question is, how do you handle forfeiture? of cash um with that usually the narcotics there's so many narcotics offices that they have to file with the um courts and then we have something in our budget and planning office that they will get a court order saying we were we get the money and they set up a time where somebody from budget and planning Somebody from narcotics and myself, I'll grab the money, we go up, we count it, and then they deposit and put in our forfeiture. Makes sense. And the last one, how do you dispose of electronics, like cell phones and tablets and things like that? Um, tablets we take to the dump and we watch them go over it to make sure they're destroyed so nobody, no workers will take it and use it. Phones, what we do is we box it up and we send it to this place so that they do phone cards for the troops. Oh. So then the troops will get phone cards. It's a donation type thing we send them to. That's very cool. Very cool. That is. They can That's Google online. that cell phone, cell phone for troops and it tells you how to do it. Is there like a link for that? Is there is there something? Let me let me throw that up here. What what is that? Cell phone. Cell phone for. And all you got to do is uh, it walks you right right there. That's what we do. These guys right here, second wave recycling? Yep. Okay. And then we, they, a label comes, and they come pick it up, and they do uh, um, phone cards so the troops can call home and stuff. Any other really cool things you do like that? I'm I'm thrilled to throw that out there. That's I don't I'm sure a lot of people don't know about that. Is there any other really cool things you guys do like that? Um, our bikes. We used to sell our bikes, but now we have this bike collective here in Des Moines. So we donate the bikes to Bike Collective, and they refurbish, and then they give it to kids and things like that in the community that need a bike. That is the way to do that for sure. Do you wipe the cell phones or? take information off before you donate them or how does that work no that's why we donate them is just because either we were going to smash them up or we don't wipe anything off we just send them to them that way we get too many to worry about that i assume that's part of their process though like you, you probably have an agreement with them that they're going to do that Correct. Yeah, they don't. I mean, they're just like turn them in, recycle them, and getting phone cards, and they're mailing the phone cards. We used to send it to for domestic abuse for women to reuse it for them if they needed to call in like a hotline.
but we came up like what you're talking about that we would strip them but for whatever reason it didn't work and so then we had issues so then we stopped doing that and that's why we picked the, this, this organization all right. So I'm I'm assuming there are people that are going to need to drop off, although our numbers seem to be pretty holding pretty high. Uh, a couple of things I want to throw out to everybody inside the chat window of the GoToWebinar. So if everybody looks for the chat window, there's a link to our YouTube channel. If you will go in there and subscribe to that, every time we post videos, um, like if you miss one of these webinars, we're going to wrap all this content up and post it into our YouTube. And so to get notifications about all of that stuff, simply go in and subscribe to the Tracker Products YouTube channel and you'll get a notification every time we post videos on there. Um, and you want to be that because we're going to be doing a lot of these and we understand that you, you can't always make it to every one of them. We'll post them on the YouTube channel and that way you guys can see what other departments are saying. So all right well i'll tell you what guys um listen lots and lots of questions have come in i hope this was valuable for you since we're in a world of lockdown we're, we've got seven of these planned out today was the first one of seven i know it's a lot of them but uh next monday wednesday and friday they're they should already be on your calendars because you registered for this one uh we're going to be doing different topics different discussions different people every time so we look forward to seeing everybody back on monday if you can make it and um also, give us feedback on these things. If you guys have particular topics or things you want to discuss, we're, we're, we're simply trying to take advantage of the world slowing down a little bit, although maybe for you guys, it doesn't feel like it's slowing down. But for half of you, you're at home. So maybe this is just a great getaway from the kids tearing things up. I don't know if you guys heard it. I, I Just a real quick joke about this. I told I've got at home with two teenagers right now, and I told them I'm on a video you guys got to be quiet. When this thing started, I heard a TV fall upstairs or something. I don't know if you guys picked that up on the thing, but like a TV hit or something. And I was like, I just started this thing and we're already dropping TVs upstairs. So anyways, I appreciate everybody showing up. We look forward to doing these things again. Krista, thank you so much for being here and, and giving us all this incredible feedback. No problem. Hey, do they have like, if they want to email me with a question or anything? They yeah. have... They're going to want to hire you. I'm telling you right now, you <laughs> you are going to get some job offers today. There is absolutely no doubt in my mind that the job offers are coming. But uh, if you don't mind me posting your email in there, I will um, I will uh, send your e I, you know what? I'll send everybody your contact information if you don't mind. No, no problem. Yep, no problem. OK, excellent. Perfect. OK, Joe, any other things I have forgotten? A lot of thank yous. A lot okay. Of thank yous. That's it. Yep. Yes. All right. All right, everybody. Have a great day. Be safe out there and, and self quarantine properly. And we'll uh, hopefully see everybody on Monday. Um